me to learn about the results of a nationally representative survey on the Irish public's attitude to science in our lives. Our focus this morning, uh, as many of you may know, will be to hear from Dr. Eric Jensen of Qualia Analytics, who will take us through the detailed results from the barometer. There will be an opportunity to ask questions. We'd like to consider your comments uh, at the end of the session uh, before we close up uh, at 11 or 11.15. We'll try and keep to time as much as we can. Uh, so please do add your questions and comments to the chat as we go through the session. Um, but first, just before we get to, to Eric and the results, I'd like to uh, set a little bit of context and tell you a little bit about how and why this barometer was commissioned by Science Foundation Ireland. Uh, over the past year, we've all witnessed the importance and relevance of scientific research as we face the immense challenges of living through a global pandemic. And then amazingly seeing, I think we now have five approved vaccines approved um, with, within a year. Here in Ireland and, and across the globe, uh, researchers have engaged with the public to provide expert advice, becoming trusted commentators and, and here in Ireland, in many cases, household names. The general public have informed themselves and clearly understood the pu public health needs for restrictions and they've certainly gained a knowledge of the terminology of science from our numbers to vaccine efficacy. Science Foundation Ireland believes in the importance of public investment in research and the difference that it makes to our society and economy. It's because of our public investment in research that we have this expertise in our higher education institutes, these many excellent and talented people that have been working in these fields for decades. Um, we continue to face many challenges and we will after this pandemic from climate change to food security uh, and scientific advances really are rapidly changing all aspects of our lives. We believe that research is better when the public it serves is involved in shaping the questions from the beginning. When we broaden the participation in science, research and innovation, impact from these will be greater, stronger and more beneficial. The research we do should truly represent the vibrant and diverse society that we have here in Ireland. Considering this, we need to understand as a baseline, what are the current levels of trust and the attitudes to science amongst the public and amongst the different demographics within the Irish public. Then we can understand who is engaged, what's working well, and who and what is challenging in terms of that sense of self belonging in science amongst the public or publics. This is key to the recently launched SFI strategy uh, our strategy from now to 2025, shaping our future. Our two core ambitions to deliver today and prepare for tomorrow are seated firmly in an increased dialogue and increased engagement with the Irish public and in inspiring broader participation in STEM. These goals can only be achieved if we all work together in partnership across the complex system of government, agencies, funders, higher education institutes, public research bodies, but industry, charities, civil groups, really whoever wants to be involved in that conversation should be allowed to participate. Back in 2015, SFI commissioned the first SFI Science in Ireland barometer, which was an analysis of people's perceptions and awareness of STEM and the contribution of STEM to the Irish economy and society. While using a different approach and sampling method, the report gave us an insight into uh, from a large group survey among the general public and their attitudes. Uh, at that time, we committed to repeating the barometer uh, multiple times to help inform the critical work that we, the science community, policymakers and the public undertake in supporting engagement between science and society. In 2020, I'm delighted the barometer has evolved. Uh, SFI commissioned Qualia Analytics to deliver the report, ad adopting cognitive testing of the questions in the survey and the use of stratified randomized sampling under the guidance of an expert advisory group who helped advise and shape the approach taken to deliver this benchmark study. In a minute, I will introduce the, the chair of this expert group, Ethan Greenwood. Ethan manages the Welcome Global Monitor. 
the expert advisory group consisted of experts in statistics, in other monitors of public attitudes to science, in policy and in science communication. Um, I would like to extend a huge thank you to them on behalf of Science Foundation Ireland for all of the genuine help and guidance they provided throughout this process. When Qualia began the research for the barometer, we were in the throes of the first impacts of COVID-19 in our lives. We were emerging into the summer period uh, last year and we were experiencing a light reprieve in restrictions. At the time, Qualia tasked us to consider running a second phase of the study a year later uh, to be able to capture any impacts of the current living experiences on attitudes to science. We find ourselves now in a place where news is beginning to improve again slowly. Vaccines are rolling out, numbers are falling, but on the other hand, fatigue has firmly set in. Uh, however, we are committed to running that phase two of the study in spring and to publishing the data for comparative purposes. Um, it, it'll be very interesting to see how trust in science and the strong support for science among the public that you will shortly see evidence, evident in the results um, fares after this very difficult year for many. Before we hear from Eric on the key findings for the report, I would like to invite Ethan Greenwood to say a few words on behalf of the expert advisory group. So Ethan, I will pass over to you. Thank you, Ruth. Um, as chair of the external advisory group, it's been a real honor to participate in this survey. And on behalf of myself um, and also from the um, SFI group, I really want to thank um, the external advisors that I think were really crucial in um, informing the questionnaire the methodology, the sampling development, but also brought with them their own expertise from other country and international surveys to inform this. Um, and in particular, I would like to thank Paul Crowley from the uh, Central Statistics Office. Um, as Ruth was saying, I think this is a really um, auspicious time during the COVID crisis when science is more visible than ever uh, in front of the public. And therefore, I think these findings will prove to be extremely rich um, and insightful. Thank you. I'd now like to pass back to Ruth. Thank you so much, Ethan. Now uh, I'll invite Dr. Eric Jensen, the lead on the Qualia Analytics team, to take us through the key findings from the barometer. So Eric, if you could. Thanks very much. I'll just start my slide deck here. Okay, so. Thanks so much, and um, and of course I'd like to echo um, all the thank yous as well as um, to the the SFI team who've been tireless in uh, supporting this work. Uh, we had a, a team effort at the at Qualia to get the work done. Um, so um, my my background is a social science background. Uh, I'm a part time professor of sociology at the University of Warwick and. Uh, we had a multidisciplinary team working on the project, and um, so uh, thank you to, to everybody for the, the hard work. Uh, so here's what I'm going to be talking about. I'll uh, briefly summarize uh, what we did in terms of the kinds of data that we collected, and then I'll get into our findings. So we'll go kind of point by point to some of the highlights from this research. So first of all, just to summarize what we did, the approach we took was to do a random sample of the population in Ireland. And we used an approach where we looked at uh, sending out waves of randomized invitations based on location, based on air code. And we used postcards. So people received a physical invitation and then they were invited to respond online using the, um, the link that's, that's provided. You can see uh, an example of the back of the postcard here. And you can see our sample size that we achieved was a little bit over 1,000. And we weighted the responses we got back by the census information. So we asked matching questions to the Irish census so that we could ensure that the results we were presenting matched the characteristics of the Irish population. So now into the results. So starting with attitudes towards science, we found, uh, we, we asked people a question where we, we asked them to indicate how much they agreed with 
different ways of describing science. So they were asked to kind of complete the sentence, I think science is. And on the first one, it was on a range between depressing and inspiring. And you can see that the results skewed very strongly towards inspiring with a, a high percentage of people giving that view. Uh, we asked them to respond to dull versus stimulating. And there, again, very positive results with high percentages of people agreeing, uh, uh, taking the view that science is stimulating. On the statement science is important versus unimportant, here there were overwhelmingly positive responses with 93% of people indicating that science is important. Uh, similarly on useful, that science is useful, this skewed very strongly uh, in the positive direction with extremely small percentages of people uh, viewing science as unimportant or useless. Uh, on the range between harmful and beneficial, again, very strongly skewed in the positive direction towards science is beneficial. On the range between science is honest versus dishonest, again, positive results with 85% of people indicating that science is honest, um, but the strength of that positive sentiment was a little lighter on, on this range between dishonest and honest. On unnecessary versus essential, very strongly positive views on essential. Uh, on fascinating versus uninteresting, uh, very much skewed in the positive direction, but with a, a little bit lighter in terms of those taking the strongest view that science is fascinating. And uh, for scientists, so we asked people to respond to the same questions, but about scientists. And overall, what we found was there were similarly very positively skewed results, but a little bit less strong than the views about science as an institution. So for scientists, they got, um, as you can see, very strongly positive views on science. Scientists are inspiring, stimulating, important, useful. This got overwhelmingly positive responses at the strongest end on both science and scientists. On harmful versus beneficial, again, overwhelmingly people saying that it's beneficial. Uh, on honest versus dishonest, again, it's very strongly skewed in the positive, but less, uh, less strong. So on the kind of strongest end, uh, it's less fully represented. And so in the end, what we see here in terms of attitudes towards science from the Irish public, we see that, that huge majorities of people find science useful, important, beneficial, uh, and also feel similarly about scientists, that they're very important, very useful, and, um, and very small percentage of people that disagree, like right? down in the two, three, four percent, um, particularly on aspects like important, useful, beneficial, and essential. So here we see a, a clear pattern of, particularly for science as an institution, very positive attitudes from the Irish public. Then we, were, we also looked at trust in science and scientists. So one of the, the starting overall questions we asked was, in general, would you say you distrust or trust science and scientists? And you can see the results here that they skew very positive in terms of the, the views about science and scientists. So uh, very strong majorities, particularly for science as an institution, uh, a little bit less strong, but still very high levels of overall trust for scientists. And this, this is a, a clear pattern where we, we found that overall it's very positive. And then when we dug a little deeper to see, are there any particular um, patterns based on region or age or any, any other factors, we did find a statistically significant effect uh, based on the part of Ireland uh, where people were based, where the levels of distrust in scientists were higher in Dublin than in other parts of Ireland. Uh, which you can see at the bottom of the slide there. So we, when we're 
asking people about their overall levels of trust or distrust. We also asked about different professions in, in Ireland. So as opposed to science and scientists in general, uh, we also asked about specifically in Ireland, how do people feel about different professions? So uh, scientists in Ireland got a very positive response. You can see here 84% of people saying that in general, they trust scientists and only 4.5% uh, saying that in general, they distrust scientists. Uh, and this becomes particularly clear when we look at some comparisons with other professions. So uh, next you can see journalists in, science, uh, journalists in Ireland, and you can see that their level of trust versus distrust is actually underwater. So there's uh, more people on the distrust side than on the trust side. Uh, on government in Ireland, it's, uh, you can see split where um, right down the middle, uh, similar numbers on both sides, trust versus distrust in general. Uh, politicians in Ireland underwater in terms of distrust versus trust. Uh, and then we also asked about public health experts, medical health professionals. Here you can see the very strong positive views about these professions, which is something that has been found in the past, both in Ireland and also in other countries that uh, medical health professionals, scientists, and public health experts tend to consistently score very high on their levels of, of trust as professions. Um, and in order to kind of benchmark, get a sense of how this fits compared to trust in general that people are expressing, we also asked about how much people trust or distrust those in their community, those in their neighborhood. And you can see that that's a pretty high level of trust, but actually not as strong as the levels of trust reported for scientists, medical health professionals, and public health experts. We asked about uh, two different categories of scientists. So scientists that are working in publicly funded institutions in Ireland, like universities, and scientists working in privately funded institutions, we asked a number of questions about how people feel about, um, about the, the kind of information they're getting and, and the kind of knowledge that's produced by these two categories of scientists. So first, from the publicly funded institutions, uh, for a level of trust to pub publicly communicate accurate information. Uh, for scientists at publicly funded institutions, they got very positive responses on this with 76% of people saying that they trust scientists to publicly communicate accurate information, uh, only 9% distrust. On creating useful knowledge, even more strongly positive on, on that point. So with, with an even higher level of people saying they trust scientists to produce useful knowledge and only 5% distrust. Working with the intention to benefit the public. This again got very positive responses with pretty low levels of disagreement. On the statement that uh, about how much they trust or distrust scientists at publicly funded institutions to be open and honest about their funding, this got majority positive views in terms of trust, but you can see that there are higher levels of distrust on this point than on other, other, uh, other things we measured. And switching over to scientists at private institutions in Ireland, like um, scientists working, uh, for example, in the biotech industry or uh, for companies uh, in order to conduct their work, uh, we can see that the trust in, uh, for them to publicly communicate accurate information is lower. So it's still majority positive in terms of trust but it skews lower and there's higher levels of distrust uh, for the private institutions. On create useful knowledge, this still got very strongly positive responses, but again, softer level of support uh, on, in terms of trust to create useful knowledge from private institutions than from public. Uh, working with the intention to benefit the public, this again, majority positive responses, but but weaker levels of trust than, in, than with the publicly funded institutions. And then be open and honest about funding. This one got the highest level of distrust that we've 
found from this, this block of questions with 30% of people expressing distrust on this point uh, and 49% trust. So we also looked at what kind of change over time we could identify in the attitudes of the Irish public about science and scientists. And so uh, one of, we, we matched some of our questions to previous questions that have been used by high quality surveys that have been conducted in Ireland. Uh, and this is showing the comparison with the 2018 Welcome Global Monitor survey and we can see that there's a pattern of increased trust that is that, that can be seen. It's relatively modest levels of change, but it's all changing in the same direction uh, towards greater trust in science. Uh, you can see the different phrasings of that question, but basically the question is, in general, would you say you distrust or trust science? And you can see that that's ticked up a little bit, and then the level of distrust has come down quite a bit on the partial distrust. So um, it was already skewing pretty positive in 2018. And now with this research that was conducted in the midst of the pandemic and in, uh, in summer 2020, it went even higher. So this is to summarize those findings that I just went through. Basically, there are very high levels of trust in, in science and scientists overall. And with medical health professionals and scientists in Ireland, these are some of the most trusted professions, also public health experts. Uh, we also found that the Irish public had uh, very high levels of trust in scientific institutions to create useful knowledge. So more than anything else we asked about, they were trusted to create useful knowledge. And we found when we compared public versus private institutions, so the, the scientists working in the public institutions were scoring consistently higher in terms of the level of trust. And we found that overall, the level of trust had increased since 2018. Now, we also were able to compare the results in Ireland to those from other small advanced economies. So this is because the, some of the benchmark survey uh, research that we are comparing to, we matched some of our survey questions to, to especially the Welcome Global Monitor. And we found that Ireland was performing very well on public trust in science compared to other small advanced economies. So it was uh, the third highest level amongst uh, a set of small advanced economies from around the world um, that were surveyed in 2018. We found that if, if we're looking at the kind of weaker points in terms of level of trust, the open and honest about who is paying for the work is the, the kind of weaker part in terms of public trust. And that is consistent internationally. So when we compared the results in Ireland and we looked in other places, where is the weakest point in terms of public's level of trust, that was the, the weaker point shared internationally as well. So on to perceptions of science. So we asked, to what extent do you disagree or agree with each of the following statements? Uh, with hard work, anyone can be a scientist. So on that statement, there was um, a, a majority that said that with hard work, anyone can be a scientist, but quite a, a substantial minority that said that disagreed with that statement. So that saw a sci scientists as some, some kind of special kind of uh, a person that it's not just a matter of hard work, that there's something distinctive that, uh, that only certain people could be a scientist. Uh, so the next statement was nearly everyone is capable of doing science if they work at it. And on this one, there was a stronger level of agreement, which suggests that uh, the Irish public are seeing a distinction between being a scientist, the identity of being a scientist, and the practice or action of actually doing science. And the being a scientist is seen as some kind of more special, more different kind of identity that you have to, uh, that only certain people are capable of. We, uh, the next one is learning science changes my ideas. And this got an overwhelming level of agreement. You can see here that it's 91% uh, of people uh, agreeing with that view. Uh, and only 2% disagreeing. 
Science is useful in solving everyday problems in my life. Again, very strong levels of agreement with that statement. It is important to me that I am informed about science. Very strong agreement. Some people will always struggle with science. This is, again, getting back to the, the notion of how do people see science? Do they see it as something that is achievable to understand? If you, can, if you just work at it, you can, you can figure it out. And the, this is suggesting that there's a, a widespread view that certain people are just kind of um, able to, to be good at science and others um, are inherently um, going to struggle with it, uh, that it's not just a matter of, of hard work and that kind of thing. Science is too difficult to understand. This got um, pretty low levels of agreement. So most people felt that science is not too difficult to understand. Science has no relation to what I experience in the real world. This idea was rejected by uh, the vast majority of people. So people, uh, the Irish public see science connected to the real world. Uh, they don't see it as something that's kind of purely off exploring esoteric topics. Uh, so what we see when we zoom in a little deeper about uh, what's going on, are there any patterns where different uh, categories of people have different views about science? Uh, we did find that people with lower levels of education were less likely to see science as related to the real world. So those with lower levels of education were less positive in terms of seeing science as a kind of real world practical activity. So three quarters of people in Ireland thought that science is useful in solving everyday problems in their lives. 91% thought that learning science changes their ideas about how the world works. And only a little over half we're saying that with hard work, anyone can be a scientist, which suggests uh, an area where uh, there, there could be some, some effort on public engagement to try to address that. Um, and there also was a very high level of agreement that some people are kind of inherently going to struggle with science, uh, which also could be seen as something that needs to be um, addressed. So perceptions of science in public policy. We ask people about how they felt about investment in science by the government especially. So the first statement, public money spent on science is well worth spending. Got very strong levels of agreement. Uh, you can see 80% agreement, only 3% of people saying uh, disagreeing with that idea. The government should spend more money on scientific research. This also saw very high levels of agreement, very low levels of disagreement. The general public should have a say in how science develops. This is asking about basically how do we orient the direction of science and should the public have a say in the direction of science. And here there was much more uh, ambivalence. So um, pretty the, it's skewed towards agreement, but a fair number of people disagreeing and then a lot of people that took a neutral view on this point, suggesting they did not have an opinion about whether the general public should have a say in how science develops. When we dig deeper into differences in people's attitudes about uh, whether the general public should have a say in how science develops, here we found a significant effect where those from uh, other ethnic groups than white, so the non-white respondents, 79% uh, agreed with the idea that the, that the general public should have a say in how science develops, while the white ethnic groups agreed with this statement at only 40%. And because there are a lot more white ethnic groups in Ireland uh, than other ethnic groups, that meant that overall the results skewed. Um, you know, you see the, the, the pattern you get here, but the, the fact that this resonated so much with the other ethnic groups suggests that there is something important to look at here about whether uh, certain parts of society uh, systematically along ethnic lines are feeling like their voices need to be heard uh, for the direction of science, that they're, they're not being adequately represented in how science develops. 
So the government should look for scientific evidence when deciding how to solve problems. Very strong agreement with that view. Scientific evidence should guide government policy. Very strong agreement, very low disagreement. Scientific research should be a priority for our nation. Again, very high agreement. We asked some questions in different ways so that we can really probe for what do, what do people feel about these topics. So uh, this one is called a reverse coded item where we're asking it in the, in the kind of negative way. So this country is spending too much on science. This got very strong disagreement, very low levels of people agreed with that view. Scientific discoveries are doing more harm than good. Again, this was rejected by very wide margins uh, with relatively small numbers agreeing that scientific discoveries are doing more harm than good. So if we look at the overall picture here, we can see very strong levels of support for investment in science from the Irish public, uh, less, low, less support for, uh, in general for the idea that the general public should be guiding the direction of science, um, but bearing in mind that other ethnic groups did agree um, with a strong majority that they, they should be doing that. And Irish public, the Irish public in general see the investment in science as worth it, that it's delivering on the investment and that actually they want to spend more on scientific research um, out of the, the government funding. Perceptions of science in society is the next category. So we asked, uh, again, these level of agreement statements. And the first one is scientific research is a priority for me, uh, which uh, skewed positive, but, um, but a little bit ambivalent in people's responses. People who will be directly affected by scientific research should have a say in how it develops. So this is a little bit different than the, the last question because it's asking about stakeholders, about people who are directly affected by scientific research, not the general public. Uh, so not people in general, but specifically those who are affected. And here there, there was strong across the board agreement that the people who are directly affected by scientific research should have a say in how it develops. So for stakeholder engagement, strong endorsement. Scientists have a professional responsibility to talk about research findings with the public this got overwhelming agreement that, that people expect scientists to talk about research findings with the public. Science is making the world a better place. Very strong agreement, 84%. We need more gender diversity in science. This got a more ambivalent response with the largest percentage we found in the survey of neutral responses. Uh, signaling that people haven't really uh, given this a lot of thought or they don't have the information they need to form an opinion about it. So um, that came up a lot in the response to we need more gender diversity in science and similarly on we need more ethnic diversity in science, although uh, there was slightly stronger agreement on that, um, but still a pretty large percentage of neutral responses suggesting that they don't have an opinion on that already. When we uh, kind of dive in to look at whether there's any specific patterns, we did find a statistically significant effect where women were a bit more likely than men to agree with the statement, we need more gender diversity in science. And we asked some, uh, we, have, we have some, a number of questions where we were able to compare the 2018 to the 2020. So we also did that here looking at whether people feel that scientists are benefiting, uh, kind of, kind of uh, widely benefiting society. So is it the case that, that uh, most people are benefiting, only a few people are benefiting, kind of is science for, uh, for everyone or is it only benefiting a privileged few? And in general, People felt that science is a kind of uh, benefiting most people and that they strongly agree that science is, is addressing the real problems of ordinary people. So this view is very strong in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, so we got less people that had the kind of uh, middle of the road neutral or some kind of view 
uh, and then more that were very clear that uh, science is 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 really addressing uh, problems of ordinary people that it's not just for a privileged few. So the overall picture here is that the Irish public were confident about science's positive impact on society, uh, that science is making the world a better place. They believe that scientists have a responsibility to engage with the public about their science. Uh, they were let the, on the question of stakeholder engagement about uh, those directly affected by science. They felt they should have a say in how science develops. And there was a strong view that science is benefiting ordinary people in their real lives. When we compare these kinds of responses to the international uh, kind of view of other small advanced economies, we find that the Irish public is more strongly convinced of the benefits of science for ordinary people's lives than almost every other small advanced economy we, we see glo globally with the lone exception of Denmark. And this of course may have been affected by the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we asked people about their perceptions of their own capabilities. And here uh, the statement, the first one is, I am the type of person who can be a scientist. And this was split relatively evenly in people's views. So again, suggesting that there's a view that a scientist is a kind of distinctive category, that it's not just a matter of hard work or time invested, um, but there's something specific about scientists. Not everybody can be one. Uh, and then we asked about, I am the type of person who can do science. And again, on the actual practice side, much more agreement, uh, much less hesitance for people to say they're the type of person who can do science, just not to be a scientist, that identity. Uh, when we dig a bit deeper, we look at whether there are any patterns. We found that older generations and those with lower levels of education were less confident about their ability to do science. So there was a statistically significant pattern here by age and by education. And those who were older, lower education, were less confident in their, their capacities around science. We asked, I have a good understanding of science. We see skewed towards the positive, but with a substantial minority uh, disagreeing. I feel capable of understanding science got much stronger um, support. And in general, I feel well informed about science, skewed positive with substantial numbers of neutral responses where people did not have an opinion on that. They had not uh, formed a view. On the statement about I have a good understanding of science, we found that older members of the Irish public tended to have a lower level of confidence in their understanding of science. We asked these questions in the reverse as well. So uh, kind of um, negatively framed. I am not the type of person who can understand science. That view was rejected uh, very widely. I am the type of person who will always struggle with science. This was majority rejected, but a substantial minority um, agreed. And science is not for me uh, also got similar levels of response. So majority, disagree, but, but a substantial minority take that view. When we look at how informed people feel about science and whether it's changed uh, from 2018 to 2020, we did see a shift in the positive direction. So those giving a negative response dropped on the question of how much they know about science, how well informed they are about science, and those giving a positive response shot up so we did, we saw less effect on the edges of those who gave a very positive or a very negative response, although there was a drop on the very negative. Um, but those in those kind of middle areas, there was a clear shift uh, from negative over to the positive side. And then the overall summary, basically um, majorities of the Irish public see themselves as well-informed, capable of understanding science, uh, and the, the pattern we found where there was the, the lowest level of confidence 
was around capability of being a scientist. So again, finding that distinction between doing science and being a scientist with uh, less confidence on being a scientist or capable of being a scientist. So when we looked at Ireland compared to other small advanced economies, we found that the Irish public in 2020 was at the highest level in terms of their feeling well-informed about science compared to the other countries where we only have data for, for 2018 for those at this point. And that's, uh, that's the kind of patterns around self-perception of science capabilities. We also asked about media behavior, so about uh, how people gain access to scientific information. So within the last 30 days, how often have you been following what's going on in government and politics? So majority of people uh, have been following that. News in general, a lot of people following the news in general. Health news, a lot of people following health news. Technology news was more evenly split in terms of people following that. Uh, we did find that there was a gender effect on following technology news where that was more common for men than for women. On art and style, that skewed towards no, people not, have not been following it. Popular entertainment news, pretty even split. Sports news, relatively even split, but skewing towards no. And science news, uh, was skewing a little bit towards um, people have been following it, but, um, but a lot of people not following science news as well. So the overall pattern was uh, we found a lot of people following the news, which of course in July, August 2020 included a lot of science, a lot of uh, things about COVID, public health, uh, this kind of stuff. Um, but it was kind of under the, under the area of government and politics, health news, um, people did not identify with following science news very much compared to those other categories. In terms of perceptions of COVID, so we added a block of questions that were about the COVID crisis. And we started by asking how familiar people felt with the coronavirus COVID-19. And unsurprisingly, it skewed towards extremely familiar. We asked about their level of agreement with different statements. Getting sick with the coronavirus, COVID-19 can be serious. That was overwhelmingly, people agree with that view. Uh, I will probably get sick with the coronavirus, COVID-19. That was a, uh, tended to be people disagreed with that view. They did not think that they would personally get sick. The coronavirus, COVID-19 will not affect very many people in my community. That most people disagreed with. So they thought it will affect the community. It is serious, but it's probably not going to affect me. I'm probably not going to get sick. So we asked uh, attitudes about different steps that could be potentially taken. Uh, so we asked about how they would feel like favorably versus unfavorably if COVID vaccination was available in their local area and people tended to view that very positively, 75% positive. So we can see the overall pattern here is a clear recognition and, and acknowledgement and acceptance of the seriousness of COVID-19. So not a lot of people rejecting, saying it's a hoax, uh, not seeing it as a real problem. Um, but in terms of assessment of individual risk, very few people thinking that they individually are likely to get sick. Uh, so we asked about priorities in government decision-making about COVID-19. So in particular, we wanted to compare what the government uh, is considering the most in their decision-making versus what they should be considering the most. So you can see this with the color, the color coding here. Um, so on the, the kind of purple color, this is what the government is doing and the more kind of uh, green, blue, um, turquoise color is what they should be doing. So we see that the public had a very low estimation of the idea that the government should be following public opinion. They shouldn't be. Um, and they felt in general that the government was not being led by public opinion. Uh, in terms of prioritizing minimizing disruption to normal life, 20% thought that the government was considering that the most. 33% uh, thought they should be considering that uh, the most. 
So there they thought they sh that the government should be prioritizing concerns about disruption to normal life more. And there was a gender effect here on the, uh, the role of public opinion. So men were more likely to think that the government was being influenced most by public opinion when compared to women. So whether international influences uh, were driving government decision-making, 26% thought that was happening, that, that international influences were being considered the most versus 13% who thought it should be. The, one of the bigger gaps was around political considerations. So 29% of people thought that political considerations were driving government decision-making and only 2% thought that politics should be driving government decision-making. So that was a, a big gap. And that gap was, was uh, stronger with men than with women uh, in terms of those that believe the government was being driven by political considerations. Uh, then when it comes to scientific evidence, which is obviously one of the key things we're interested in for this study, uh, we found that 45% of people felt the government was considering scientific evidence the most and that was considerably lower than the number who thought they should be. So 81% thought that scientific evidence should be considered the most in government decision-making, which was equal with advice from medical doctors, but the gap was biggest on scientific evidence. Uh, so on economic considerations, a majority of people thought that was driving the government decision-making, only 34% thought it should. Advice from doctors, 68% percent thought it was driving the government decision-making, um, while 81 percent thought it should be. So the pattern here is pretty clear. People wanted the government to be making its decisions on the basis of scientific evidence and advice from medical doctors, and there was a fair amount of skepticism about whether that was really happening. When we asked people about their, the personal effects of COVID-19 on their lives, uh, we found, uh, we, we asked people about their employment situation before COVID, and you can see the breakdown here um, with a lot of people in paid employment, and, um, and then we asked them about what happened. So did any of the following work-related situations apply to you because of the COVID situation? 39% uh, said they'd started working from home, 34% said said there'd basically been no change to, to their situation um, in terms of their, their work. And then the, you can see 19% have been laid off uh, or furloughed uh, and 11% had their work hours reduced, 2% had lost their jobs. For health related effects, 54% said no effect, but 34% said that their mental health has been negatively affected because of the coronavirus. 19% said they experienced severe tensions in their household, and 5% said they had postponed major medical treatment because of the COVID-19 situation. So these are some very serious health-related situations that are associated with COVID-19 in Ireland. Uh, we asked about how many people felt they had had COVID. Uh, most people uh, at, at this point, um, July, 2020, uh, said no, and then we asked about how they had determined whether or not they, they have it. So for those that did say they thought they had it, uh, we checked whether they had been tested, uh, and actually most people had not been tested. So this, this was getting at the fact that there's probably some undercounting uh, of COVID cases. And then you can see the overview. Um, I think one of the, the key points here is about the the potential toll on mental health um, emerging from COVID-19 with, with such a high percentage of people reporting that they have been negatively affected um, by, uh, in terms of their mental health. That's something that, that really needs to be addressed. And on COVID-19 um, media consumption, we asked whether people have been more or less interested in different uh, kinds of media, news in general, um, they, indicated that they had, they had started following the news more, uh, they started following government and politics more, 
Um, they had started following health news about the same. Most people said about the same. Technology news about the same. Uh, art and style news skewed towards more interested. Popular entertainment news, more interested. Sports news, uh, mostly about the same. And science news, mostly about the same uh, and skewing towards less interested. Uh, we asked about people's primary news sources, 60% uh, said RTE. And uh, about those that relied on, on news sources from the UK, which ones were predominant, and BBC and Sky News were the, the bigger ones. Uh, people tended to be getting their news from television, um, but also radio and news websites. Uh, we asked about how often people were turning to their news source for information about COVID, and 70% said daily, daily news, uh, with another 12% almost daily. So people were following COVID news very closely, and they tended to trust their primary news source that it had reliable information about the COVID situation. So the overall picture was one where people have different levels of accessing of um, different kinds of news over time, but COVID news in particular is something that people were accessing a lot and uh, almost like the vast majority daily or nearly daily uh, for more information about the COVID situation. So those are the findings overall, uh, uh, even more in the, in the report that will be available on the website. Uh, I hope you have, uh, you take a look. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks, Eric. Um, thanks so much. So uh, an awful lot to absorb there. Um, I'm sure people will need to take time to take it all in. Um, the report is available on our website, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, we've shared that out through our social media channels on how to link into it. So um, I'm sure people will want to be able to take that on board. And there will be, again, apologies for our delay in starting and some of our technical difficulties, but we will have a recording of the session also available available on the website. So lots of opportunities for you to be able to, to get into the depth of the report. As Ruth pointed out, this is a very useful source of data for all stakeholders. And the basic information in it will tell us how we can target activity, where there are areas of concern, areas for opportunity to stimulate conversations with people in relevant and accessible ways and, and hear their concerns and the concerns that they're raising amongst different demographic groups. So as I said, we'll, we will be making all the data sets available as well. Um, so uh, I, I can see there's some questions coming in. I'll be asking the, the Eric to, and Ruth to join us again in a minute. Um, but I did want to, I suppose, share a little bit of perspective from, from SFI before we move into the general questions. Um, as I said, the findings are going to be useful in different ways for different people. Um, I suppose one of the things that really jumped out at me, because whenever we look at reports like this, sometimes we can immediately hone in. I know we do hone in on where are the challenges, like where are the concern areas? But 84% of people thinking science makes the world a better place. Now, that, that's a moment to have and look at a lot of the results, which are very reaffirming around the strong public support for science in our society. Um, obviously, SFI is committed. We recent, recently launched our new strategy. We're committed to growing support for research and innovation with all the, the many research actors in our ecosystem in Ireland. Science and scientists are really trusted by the Irish public, and we have a little bit of thinking to do around that disconnect between science being slightly more trusted than scientists. And that's really important in terms of our engagement with the public and for us to recognize that as a, as a funding agency in the system. The public also believe that scientists have a responsibility to talk about research findings with the public and that people affected by research should have a say on how it develops. That strongly underpins SFI's commitment to stimulating, creating, supporting and enabling dialogue with the public. We're really supported to engaged research where conversations happen between science and the communities that it serves at the very early stages and all the way through as research develops. We work closely with Campus Engage on that and we want to support participative, co-creative and inclusive approaches to public engagement through the SFI Discover programme funding. 
There are significantly neutral answers in there around diversity in STEM, as Eric pointed out there. Those kind of questions need a, a bit of knowledge about the sector, um, but still the statistics in the sector don't lie in terms of we genu genuinely do need better diversity within the scientific practitioner side. Um, and that's really important in terms of driving solutions that are really fit for purpose for everyone in society. 79% of the public agreed that scientific evidence should play its strong part in guiding public policy and that it should be used by governments when driving solutions and making decisions about solutions for society. That's so much a part of our next five year strategy in Science Foundation Ireland and we'll be working with our community to try and enable and support that to happen. In particular, I suppose I'd point out how we will use these results. Well, immediately they'll be informing the objectives for the next SFI Discover program call. Um, we will be publishing guidance on SFI's perspectives on education and public engagement. So that will be happening in, in 2021. We'll also be considering how these results can be used as indicators for we are committed to repeating the barometer on a regular basis. As Eric pointed out, we will be running another phase of the of the barometer very shortly and we're committed to publishing that as quickly as possible and it will give us a really well not much uh fantastic stuff has happened because of the pandemic uh, because the two barometers will be done within a year it will give us a snapshot of the ebbs and flows that are potentially there in terms of public support around science we're working as well with qualia eric and his team in terms of exploring workshops on how people could use these cognitively tested questions in their work in engaging with the public. So at this stage, what I might do is ask uh, Eric and uh, Ruth and Ethan, if you're there to, to turn your screens back on, we'll turn to some of the questions that have been posted by people. Uh, we are committed to ending the session by 11.20, as we had said, to make sure uh, we stay within the time uh, for everybody. Uh, but there have been some questions online. If there are any further questions, please, please do post them to the barometer at, SF, barometer at sfi.ie, because I'm sure there'll be more as you absorb the information. Eric, I think a lot of these questions are, are geared towards you. I'll start first of all is, can we provide data regarding the preferred sources of scientific information and corresponding demographics of Ireland, in, in other words, age and location? Yeah, um, I mean, we're, we're publishing the full data set um, so that people can, can run um, additional analyses as, as they would like. But um, basically, we, we asked about what information sources people have turned to and um, how much they trust them. Uh, for different kinds of information. Um, and so we didn't only ask about science news because uh, not everybody kind of differentiates their access to information as like science information and other information. It's kind of all information. So uh, we, have a, we have a kind of full set of questions about where people get information, how much they access it and how much they, they trust it, um, including with demographic breakdowns. Great, thanks, Eric. There's there's a few questions here about um, did we interview participants or did we di dive into particular groups? For example, did we interview any participants to gauge the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the answers? And also, did we collect any data from people with disabilities? So maybe a little bit of detail around how we delved into the demographics. Sure. Yeah. I mean, this is um, this is purely a survey study. So uh, we collected uh, survey data. Um, I mean, there there are studies that are happening that are using qualitative interviews uh, to to get into more depth and detail, um, including um, one that I'm involved in, and also kind of tracking over time how people um, are responding. So uh, there's a, a website, viralcommunication.info, if you uh, want to see some of that kind of research, um, but in this case, we were focusing on a large scale representative survey study rather than uh, kind of deep dives with qualitative research, although that could be an interesting follow up um, that could be done in the future. Okay, great. Um, and I, I suppose it is worth noting, um, we had, a, I suppose, a, a much lower response rate from other ethnic groups in, in the, so 
we'll be thinking about that, I suppose, in terms of how we can gather that voice and have it heard in the barometer in future future um, plans. So um, any evidence for possible possible mediating or confounding factors explaining the great the result of greater distrust in scientists by those in Dublin? Because we did see, remember that a big kind of percentage hike in, in Dublin. Uh, in, I mean, uh, that for that, you'll have to kind of stay tuned for the academic articles to follow. Um, we're we're going to be diving deeper into the more sophisticated statistical analyses uh, to follow up. Uh, for this one, we only looked at two variables at a time um, in, in the analyses for this report. So we, we haven't like stacked up all of the demographic variables together to look at the relative contribution of each one, uh, but we will definitely be doing that in the follow-up academic articles. Okay, great. Thanks, Eric. Um, there is a question there about, uh, did you ask uh, about how people would like to interact with scientists? Um, I suppose there's no yeah, direct- Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, it, it does, it's, it's in there uh, in a way. So we asked about how people felt about um, kind of upstream forms of engagement where they're able to feed in their views and, and have scientists kind of use them to inform how they do science, um, which is something that's seen as quite a high priority uh, in research funding circles um, internationally at the moment. Uh, and there, there wasn't um, strong enthusiasm for general public upstream engagement like that, but there was enthusiasm for stakeholder engagement where those who are going to be kind of directly affected. Uh, so that that's a kind of science communication related um, piece of, of insight that there's strong support for stakeholder engagement, less enthusiasm for uh, just general public uh, guiding the direction of research. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, Ruth, I might bring you into a question here. Um, there is a question about has SFI consulted with the public in terms of how we allocate a uh, budget and are we, are, are the public aware? How do we engage with them in terms of priority areas? I know um, our own department has plans this year, but uh, you might jump in there if you have any comment. Yeah, I mean, obviously, SFI has a fairly broad mandate at the moment. We, we cover really all areas of STEM and, and every every kind of activity from from primary schools, working, working with teachers who are trying to enhance STEM education all the way through to absolutely cutting edge research. And I suppose we, we kind of have a portfolio approach. So we have some very large investments in, in big centers that, that sit across Ireland. And those are in key strategic areas which have, have kind of been endorsed by, by the government at a policy level. But then obviously for our programs where we're talking about individual researchers and early career researchers, it's very open. And we have this individual led programs where, where I suppose it's all about ideas uh, bubbling up. And, and I think you, you touched on it then, Margie, engaged research. I, I, I suppose it's not necessarily something you just learn as a researcher. And I think, you know, what we've been doing working with people like Campus Engage, the HEA uh, and the institutions in Ireland is supporting researchers to do that kind of stakeholder mapping of their work before they start and, and, and focusing on, I suppose, the, the methods and the practice in, in those areas to make sure that, that we do get the right voices heard, but of course still leave that free space for researchers to drive new and exciting uh, angles that that maybe we can't even anticipate yet great um thanks ruth um i am unfortunately going to draw us to a, a close there uh, in the interest of time for everyone i think we've covered uh, all the questions that have appeared up in social but as i said at the beginning, uh, or sorry, at the beginning of the close, uh, I, I understand people will probably want to take on board and absorb the data that's coming from this report. Um, we're very open to further questions through barometer at sfi.ie. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye out on, on social media as well, and we will be keeping people informed on how we're using the barometer findings to inform our work. So uh, lastly, just to remind people that the barometer is available, the full report and the data sets will be soon available 
available on the website. Um, so then it falls to me to say thank you for attending. We really hope you will find this data useful and will use it in your work. Um, I'd really like to acknowledge Eric, Lars and the team in Qualia for the great work they've put into completing the barometer. Uh, thanks again to Ethan um, for, for leading in the expert group and for Michael Feeney for joining us today um, for his fantastic signing here. Um, and lastly, it would be very remiss of me not to recognize uh, my two colleagues, Marina Mulligan and Tanya Callas, who have played Trojan roles as well in completing the report internally from SFI. So thank you very much and enjoy the report.